Can anybody tell me what's the greatest weapon that the devil has in his arsenal? Any ideas? Guilt, doubt, fear. Yeah, those are all good things. Okay. A lot of good things. But the greatest weapon of the enemy is not in trying to get you to do bad things or to try to get you to fear or doubt. Absolutely not. The greatest weapon of the enemy is to get you involved in doing good things. Now, I know that's going to sound confusing to some of you, but I'll clarify it before the end of this message. I Trust me. Uh, doing good things. Because most times, doing something good is good, right? The world tells you it's good. We believe it's good. But many times, doing something good keeps us from the real purpose that God called us to do. I know it's confusing, and that's supposed to be that way. Hang with me. The Lord's plan for your life is basically called a vision. God has a vision and a plan for each and every one of our lives. Um, in his presence and involved with his body is usually the only way that vision comes into clarity. Because otherwise we're distracted. If we're not in his presence, if we're not involved in a body that is his body, the church, if you're not involved, it's very hard to get established in the things that God has called you to do. Now, many times people think that the work you do is what God called you to do. Many times people think, you know, well, I'm called to be a doctor or a lawyer or blah, 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 whatever it might be. And, and that's what God, you know, that's my purpose in life. And it could be, it very well could be. But most times it's not what you went to school for. And it's not what you think it might be. <clears throat> because we get so busy doing things, because we're so busy as a society, um, our, our lives start along a particular path. You know, you make a decision. First of all, you go to college, right? When, you're, when you go to college or you get out of high school, we don't know what, what we want to do. Really, I mean, there are some people who are graced with having that understanding, and they know what they want to do, and bango, they do it. But for most of us, for me, I had no clue what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. I had no clue. Sometimes today I wonder, still, do I see, what do I want to be when I grow up? I, I don't know. But in order to reach our full potential, which is involved in the purpose, the vision that God created me for, when he formed me in my mother's womb, he said he knew us before we were born. He said, while you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Ooh. Think about it. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. That's confusing. Isn't it? Yeah. It's very confusing. But here's the thing. Trusting in God is something all of us as Christians believe we do. The problem is, most times we don't really know what that cost is involved with in actually trusting God with everything. So we end up in a particular path. Well, I make a decision, I get this job. And you, then you get married, and then you have kids, and then you have you know, responsibilities in life. And, and, and the next thing you know, you wake up, and years have gone by, and you're doing something, maybe not that you're really happy about doing, but you're doing it, it's providing for you. Um, and it seems like there's no time for anything else. It seems like I, I don't know how to change. How can I? This must be what God wants me to do. Is it? We end up being very busy, but ultimately not really effective. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The interesting thing about this proverb, it actually starts out with, you know, writing upon the tablet of your heart. You know, it's, it's all about a deep and intimate and close relationship with God. Learning to trust in God with all of our heart and to lean not to our own understanding, our own mind, our own will, our own 
desires, that's not something that comes easily. As human beings, that's not normal. Have you ever done things in your life that are just like very time consuming, very, you know, involved maybe with other people or with some organization? And you, you're doing these things, and then when it was over, you looked back and you go, I don't even know why I did that. I, 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 I know I did it, but I, I, don't re, I don't really feel like that was it. I mean, maybe I even wasted my time. I don't know. I've wasted my time so many times, it's frustrating. Time is an interesting thing. I mean, I don't know if you, you understand the whole thing of time. This is awesome. It's called a lifetime. It's called a lifetime. So I actually took the time, <laughs> yeah, I actually took the time to do this. It's pretty interesting because there are all these little blocks here. And it takes you from the time you were born to, you know, about 100 years old. Well, there I am, all these X's all the way up to this point are all filled in. This is a weekly chart of your life. My wife says, what are you, a sadist? I mean, why would you do this? Why would you fill this thing up? Because it reminds me of how much time I have left. And we don't even know if we'll make it that long. We have no clue when our days are up. When God finally says, come on home. You've completed the journey. We don't know. But yet so many of us get involved in doing things, hanging with people that we don't even realize we're so far away from where God wants us to be. And I dislike the idea of wasting time. But here's the thing. Many times, the right thing and the good thing are not the same thing. I, it's confusing. I, I, I got you. The right thing is never easy, and most times it's costly. Doing the right thing usually costs you something. Time, money, definitely. Time. But doing the right thing never violates the word of God, nor the spirit of righteousness. But there's so many good things you could do today. I mean, as a Christian, we are tempted to be involved in all kinds of things. Now, before I go any further, I want to clarify. If you're involved in any of these things, it doesn't mean you're not in God's will. It does not mean that. All I'm saying them for is it might mean that. <laughs> you, you understand? There's no guarantee, but they might not be really the best thing. But there's so many good things. The idea of today's message is to clarify the difference between doing right versus doing good. Not bad art for somebody who doesn't know what he's doing, huh? That's not bad. Yeah. That took me a while to figure out. See, in other words, knowing the difference between a distraction and a purpose or calling for your life, um, that's what's significant. Knowing that is extremely significant when we're a Christian. For instance, today, there's so many community-run things like projects and social things. Um, you could find yourself having memberships in you know, community groups, organizations, clubs, fraternal groups, veterans-related organizations. There's so many things you could be involved in. Hospital, volunteer, hospice, volunteer, um, blood drives, all kinds of sport activities. Sports, right? Everywhere, whether it's from young kids all the way to adults. Sports, everywhere. Now, if you're involved in any of the above, like I said, don't get upset. Just listen to the remainder of this message because... I believe God wants to set some of us free from the burden of doing good and instead start doing what's right because it's so freeing. It's so liberating to finally know you are right where God wants you to be. Now let's talk for a minute about your purpose. Since God is our creator, he's the one that formed us in our mother's womb, he knew us even before we were there. He created us special and unique. Some of you, much more unique than others. But that's a good thing. But in that uniqueness, not only were you created to look unique, to act unique, 
right? But you were also created to do something unique, uniquely different from someone else. Now you say, well, what is that? <laughs> I don't know. That's the whole idea of this message, is to find out what it might be. Now, not all of us are going to become famous or infamous. <laughs> not all of us are going to be known, you know, in certain groups or circles. Not all of us are going to have fortune. Not all of us are going to be extremely comfortable or wealthy. All of us are different, uniquely different. In our goals, uniquely different in our, well, let's use some good words, some of the politicians, aspirations and dreams, you know. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be different. And in that difference, in that uniqueness, holistically, yes, we've got to come together with a holistic purpose of uniqueness. But in that difference, God is trying to move us to a place where we are actually doing what he formed in us when he created our being, our spirit, when he breathed life into us. And it's important to know, fulfilling your purpose usually has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. Two separate things. You come to Christ, you trust in the Lord, you give your life to God, you know, you confess the Lord, he's in your heart. The Bible says, if... You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. So that's a separate, sometimes people get confused. They go, well, if I'm not fulfilling my purpose, oh my God, am I going to go to heaven? It has nothing to do with your salvation. But it does have to do with the crowns and the blessings that God has waiting for you in eternity. Now, some may never fulfill their purpose on this earth. That's a sad thing, a sad truth, but it is a reality. Many Christians go through life never really reaching the fulfillment of the purpose that God established for them. So all these organizations, like I mentioned, um, they have their place. They do. Many offer great things to the communities, you know, to people in, in, in need, so on and so forth. But as a Christian, I, I implore you, listen carefully. We have a higher calling than just doing good. We are appointed as ambassadors to the kingdom of God. And I've said many times, only, well, let's put it this way. We have a singular purpose all of us share, and that is to be a reconciler of man back to God. We're, we're called to the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people back in communication and in relationship to God. And in that purpose, in that plan, if we do that, well, we fulfill that one part that God has called us to do, be a reconciler. That's wonderful. And in that, you can celebrate and be happy. But beyond that, God also has a purpose for your life that will help bring other people, <laughs> greater than you ever thought, the number of people that you can affect in your life, to bring some of those people also into the kingdom of God. Because everything that we do when it's lined up with God's purpose plays into his greater good of bringing men, women, to salvation. Because that's really what it's all about. Now, when it comes to God, we know what Scripture says. Scripture says, Matthew 6, but first seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. Romans 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, well, our minds are not set on the things of the Spirit. We're so consumed with fleshly things that we miss out on the call of the Spirit. Well, we've, all, we've all been given gifts or talents of some sort. We've been given time, we've been given talent, we've been given treasure. We only have so much time. You can't extend your time. Sorry, you could pray and, you know, maybe like the prophet, he'll extend yourself and give you 15 more years or something. That's a possibility. But uh, why take that chance? It's better to get about the kingdom's business while we can. 
But what we do with our time and our treasure and our talent is really the essence of the call upon our life. Now, you all know the story I'm about to read in Matthew chapter 25. For it says this, for it was like a man, this is the kingdom of heaven, it's like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. He who had received the five talents came and brought forth five more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I've made five more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who also had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I've made two more for you. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here is what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with some interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more, and he who has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That scripture scares some people. And it should. We've all been giving gifts, time, talent, and treasure. And what we do with those gifts has significance in eternity. Like I said, nothing to do with your salvation here, but it does have significance in eternity. We're not all equal. God built diversity into each of us. Thankfully, we're not all the same. Imagine everybody being like me. (laughs) Wow. Talk about hell on earth. Wow, that would be tough, right? My wife's going, yeah, yeah, no. (laughs) Some people have many talents. Some people have one. Now, in life, in society, in culture today, that might seem unfair, but not in God's economy. God doesn't equate talents to value as we do. The parable of the talents teaches us that you are valuable to him but not based on what you do, rather to whom you belong. Hear me, hear me. You know, there are people who have great talents, singers and and songwriters and musicians and, uh, you know, people who just like Elon Musk has the ability to just like think of a thousand great things at once and make them come to... I mean, there are some people who just have such great abilities and talents. And there are some people who can just barely make it through a day. Honestly, but God doesn't think any less based on the talents. It's all about to whom you belong. And when you belong to Christ, you're going to want to fulfill the things that God has done for you, even if it's only a little. We've all been purchased with a price, a severe cost involved with the price, the blood of Jesus. So we actually are not our own any longer. To quote a famous politician, our dreams and our hopes and our aspirations are all found in him. All of them. Everything we can ever be or want to be or can do is all based on what God has destined for our life. And so we shouldn't desire to please others. We should desire to please him. He died for us. The quality and the depth of our life is not based on how much you have, but what you do with what you have. So you may say, well, I don't have much talent. I I, I don't have disability. But what you do have is significant. 
You may look at yourself and what do I have that's significant? You have something. You have something in you that is significant. Doesn't matter how young or how old you are, you have something in you that is significant, that can reach and touch another person. It might be just a testimony. It might just be a word of encouragement. It might just be your smile. It might be something so minuscule about your character that you don't even realize. But no matter what, we will all be held accountable for the gifts and the talents and the treasure that God gave us. He's given us everything we need to accomplish the work that he set aside for each of us. But God is more concerned about our character rather than our performance. And what I mean by that is, although we need to move in the direction of God's gifts and talents in our life and what he's called us to do, our purpose, our vision, although we need to move in that direction, listen, God is more concerned with our character than how much we get accomplished. So the journey is more about us becoming more Christ-like. You hear me? The parable of the talents makes it clear that the lazy servant's problem was that he wasted the talents that were given to him. The real underlying issue, believe it or not, if you read that really well and understand what it meant in the original language, he actually didn't like the master. That's right. He really didn't like the master. The talents and him hiding them was more a byproduct of his heart. His heart needed conversion. His heart held unforgiveness. His heart held an attitude against the master. But the bottom line is, God created him with a purpose as well as you and I. Now, wouldn't you prefer to do the, to do the things that God determined for your life? I mean, I would. I would much rather do whatever it is God called me to do than I would to do the things that I want to do. Now, of course, I've been in the Lord for over 40 years, and you kind of realize over time that, you know, the things that I want are never really good for me, <laughs> most of the time, anyhow. So I prefer to do the things that God wants for me because I know in the end that's going to be good. It's going to be good for me. But the question comes down to this. How do we know what to do? Right? How do we know? I talk to people all the time and people say, Pastor Mike, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I should be doing. This is where faith comes into action. To be able to see things beyond the natural and believe God. I know a person very well. Um, he had been volunteering in a hospital situation um, and also a member of a local fraternal organization for over 20 years, deeply involved in both. He came to the Lord at a, at a couple of years before me, age 25, and at this time he was about 40. Um, when he woke up completely restless, woke up one night just sweating. And he felt as if everything he had been doing wasn't what he should have been doing. He just had that, that feeling, uh, urgency, uh, a sense of, you know, almost doom came over him. And as a leadership of the church, we, we prayed with him and prayed for him and we said, look, you know, that's the enemy trying to, you know, get you to feel hopeless, but God, wants to use that to get you to examine your life, to see where God has for you. So he was a member of a local church, um, but all he was was a member. Um, he, he wasn't involved in much because he already had other commitments. One day, a visiting minister came to church, and he challenged the church. He was a missionary. And this guy found himself volunteering to travel to Asia for a 21-day missions trip. Now, I knew him really well, and this is completely out of character. And after he made the commitment to go, he was like sweating, literally. 
It's like, I don't know. I don't know if I should go. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I can get out of it. You know, I'm not sure what to do. I can tell you this. I don't even know how many years ago that was, uh, but it's over 30, about 30, maybe somewhere along that line. Um, today, he's responsible for the oversight of multiple orphanages in Asia. He is completely like he's immersed in God and he is completely content. And he knows he's in the midst of God's will for his life because the decision that he made would affect not only his life, but his wife and his children, who today all serve God in ministry. But what I didn't tell you was his marriage was on the verge of divorce before all this. His kids wanted nothing to do with him, literally. And as far as his job, the one he actually worked for to make money, he didn't really like it very much. See, I see so many Christians today living day to day just surviving basically waiting to die when life really should be an adventure it really should be life should be a daily walk of faith but for so many christians it's nothing close to that it's more like drudgery just to get through and we look for all different things to do to feel fulfilled we, we we try to fill the void in our life you know with cars and money and jobs and people and volunteering to help the sick and volunteering to help the poor and volunteering to help people in need while all the while we're missing out on the true calling that god has for us which can only be found in his perfect will so today i'm going to lay out four simple steps these, these are, these are life-changing. They were for me, they were for him, they were for many others that I know. These four steps can literally revolutionize your life. Where does this start? It all starts with being obedient to the Word of God. And as a Christian, the first step in obedience is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. It says this, Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Did you hear that? Provoke one another to love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so the much more as you see the day approaching. What? The day of the Lord. Just look at the time in which we live. Prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. I'm going to talk a little bit about that next month. This is this month coming, October. And, 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 and right before us is unfolding biblical prophecy happening. God says, provoke one another. Encourage one another. And don't forsake getting together. That's what it means to come to church. God doesn't want you to go to church because it's a law. He wants you to go to church so you could be blessed. Amen. See, I don't want you to go to church so we have more seats filled. I want you to go to church so you can fulfill your purpose. The mission of this church is to save the lost, equip those who are saved, and then send them. The idea is to see you doing things for the kingdom's sake. Now you might say, well, I'm involved in this and I'm involved in that. Maybe, maybe, maybe God's will is in the midst of that. Maybe. But I can tell you more than likely, <laughs> because it's the way God is, more than likely, you'll find that what God wants you to do you're going to be like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if I could do that. So I'm going to help you do the right thing. Not just the good thing, but the right thing. Four simple steps. Number one, God. God. Everything starts and ends with him. The Jews don't use the name of God or any other proper name. Uh, Hashem. Um, and that's because of a reverence, a respect, an awe, a majesty, an understanding of the greatness and the sovereignty of God. Something I've been kind of talking around for the past couple of months, 
soon I could tell a message is coming on the sovereignty of God. But it's really all about him. Our life is not about us. He allows us to have a good life. He allows us to do things. He allows and wants to bless us. But it's really all about him and his purposes. He'll bless us as long as we're doing what he wants. And we'll find he corrects those whom he loves, chastises those he loves. Everything starts with God. So placing him as the foundation of everything is where it all begins. Now, I know if I ask you, is God first in your life, everybody's going to say yes, because that's the standard Christian answer. But the truth is, I can give you one simple example, just one, extremely simple, very easy. Think of the person who you love the most in this life. Could be a child, a granddaughter, a son, an aunt, an uncle. Okay, it could be anybody, father, mother. I mean, think of that person right there. God says, I'm first, not them. I'm first. You know why a lot of marriages fail, struggle? Because either the wife or the husband puts the kids over the marriage. Hello. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I, I, that's, 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 the, the, that's just the foundation of truth. The one reason why relationships don't work is because they put someone else ahead of God. When God is first, it means he's first. Abraham is the proof of that in the story of Abraham. Willing to take his own son and offer him as a sacrifice. And God didn't stop him, not until he was in the process of striking. And if you read the story, I mean, the angel had to really... No, stop! Read his words, spend time in his presence. There was just a recent study done. It was only a couple of years back. Um, I'm not sure if it was Barnum, but I forget the name of the group that did it. And what they were studying was um, the, 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 the joy, the happiness, and the fulfillment of people's lives based on how much time they spend in the Word of God. And what they found is people who read God's Word one day a week, um, they found no significant difference. Two days a week, no significant difference. Three days a week, they start to see some significant differences beginning. At four days, you read... Every day, four days in the course of a week, maybe an hour of your time, spend it in the Word of God. Life changes begin to happen. Substantive changes begin to happen in your life. I mean, that's significant. <laughs> that's extremely significant. We need to recognize God tells us we have something that they didn't have 2,000 years ago. They didn't have a few hundred years ago. We have Bible in all kinds of forms, all available at our fingertips. If we spend time in his presence, reading his word, and then time alone, just listening, not listening to music, not talking, not praying out loud, just spend time in his presence, you will hear the voice of the shepherd. You'll hear his voice. You'll get to know his voice. You'll learn to listen to him, and you'll get to know his voice intimately. I've used this example many times. If I were to pick up the phone or if you were to pick up the phone and call me, some of you, I would probably go, who's this? Right? Because we don't spend that much time together and I may not recognize your voice. But if my wife calls me or some of you who I know well, I mean, other than the caller ID telling me who you are, <laughs> But if, if I answered it and didn't see the caller ID, I would recognize your voice. Because we've become close. That's how it happens. Colossians 1.6 says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on the earth, things that are visible, things that are invisible, whether thrones, rulers, powers, or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. All things. That means your voice, your, your boss, your job, 
you, you're, everything you're involved, everything was created for him. <laughs> Think about that. So really, your life has nothing to do with you. That was the greatest revelation I think I got. It's like, your life has nothing to do with you, Mike. You're not that important. And it's the truth. It's really all about him. And how he chooses to use us. Even that he would choose to use us is amazing. Come on. I think about that sometimes and I go, the God of creation. The God of Abraham, Isaac, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knows me. That's powerful. Why are we so afraid to get intimate with God? Maybe it's not fear. Maybe it's the enemy whispering in your head. Maybe it's the enemy giving you ideas. Maybe it's people around you. Maybe it's the company that you keep. The first step to getting to know God is to getting away from the negative influences in your life. An addict, you'll know what I'm about to say. One of the first things you'll learn if you want to be set free is to get out of your current environment. You cannot be a druggie, get set free from drugs, and go back into the drug environment in 99% of the cases. You can't do it. Why? <laughs> because you're going down. You can't expose yourself to that. That would be like an alcoholic hanging around a bar. You can't do that. We have to sometimes get away from the negative influences. And this is the hard part. See, getting, we all think, yeah, well, I love God, I know God. How much do you love God? Because if you love God and you put him first, 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 number one, it means everything else you're willing to let go of. Just think right now of that person who is the least godly person in your life. Right now, you know who that is, right? How much time are you spending with them? Now, as a Christian, there are times God puts us in their life as a testimony to bring a word, to bring encouragement, to maybe do this or do that, but it's, it's not, not supposed to be living with them. You know what I mean? You're not supposed to be moving in with them, spiritually speaking. Forget about physically speaking, but, you know? I mean, there are Christians I know who actually live with unsaved people. Some of you, unfortunately, have that in your own home. I'm not saying that's what you have to do is move out, no. But when you have the choice, when it's someone who's not a relative or a husband or a wife or something, and you have the choice of who you live with, get the heck out. Get out. Get away from that influence. Because you can't possibly build a holy, loving, intimate, close relationship with God when you're in an environment that's filled with negativity and all kinds of four-letter explicatives and all those other things that can suck you right back into the world. God. Guess what number two is? Yeah, find a good church. Hallelujah. Find a good church. And this is the hard part for me. It's, it, it is hard. Because I know many of the pastors in this area. I know many throughout the state. There's a lot of good pastors out there that love God. There's, they, I believe that to a degree. I'm not special. We're not special. But finding a strong church that teaches the word, speaks the word without compromise, speaks the word of truth about the time in which to live, about the application of our Christianity to our daily life, is very, very rare. And it's getting more rare as we look. A strong Bible-believing church will not compromise. And if you get established in a church like that, see, here's, the, here, here's what happens. People come to a church like this, and they look for the negatives because they can't handle it. They can't handle it because there's too much pressure. And I, I'm not a pressure person. I'm not putting pressure on anybody, but the Word does. What does the word bring? The, the, the word brings conviction. See, if you're unsaved, you're taking it as not conviction. What are you taking it as? Criticism, judgment. You're taking it as condemnation. 
See, if you're unsaved, you hear words like this and you feel condemned. Ha! Therefore now there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction and they don't recognize it. So the first thing, their first response is, what did I say last week, what does a sheep do? Flight. They run. Why? Because they can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth. You want the truth? Everybody says they want the truth until you tell them the truth. Come on, you got kids. Oh, Dad, come on, tell me the truth. Okay, you sure you want this? You sure, you sure you want this, right? Because I don't know if you're going to like me when it's over. We can't handle the truth. Only with Christ can we. You need a church that's going to help you find and fulfill your purpose. It won't happen overnight. Sometimes it won't happen in weeks or months. Sometimes it may take years. But I can tell you this. When God knows the time and the time is at hand, it'll be revealed. But it won't be revealed if you're not in the right place at the right time. I, I, I don't know what better way to say it. It's so true. Listen, this church, we could be literally, without exaggeration, we could be overflowing with people. All they would need is another person that is not like me. <laughs> We've had hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds. I'm telling you. But... Sometimes it was me that scared him away, but most times it was the truth. And the temptation to having a full house and having a lot of people is great. And let me tell you, it never goes away. I'm constantly tempted. But I can't give in to that because otherwise everything is gone. Because I know the truth sets us free. And so many people, they're wandering, and then they go somewhere else, and they wander, and then they go somewhere else. I love when you sit down and I talk to people, and please don't take this personally. Well, maybe you have to. But, I mean, I've asked some people, and then they get a, they get a little upset with me, and I go, so, um, how long have you been saved? They say, oh, I've been saved 35 years. And I said, well, great. I said, where, where have you lived all that time? Well, oh, right here in this area, great. How many churches have you been in? One, two, three, four... Uh, eight. <laughs> now, sometimes it's because of the church they were in. It's not their fault. Because it's pretty tough to find a good church. But don't let it be your fault. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be because you got offended. We're Christians. What? Offense is going to come. <laughs> Hello? And if I don't offend you, one of these other people sitting in the seat next to you, they're going to offend you. I can guarantee it. It's going to happen. Why? Because we're sheep. We smell. Actually, I don't right now. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so let us consider one another. Because finding a strong church requires that those in the church are open to correction. Open to change. Open to saying... I think I was wrong. Ooh, I actually said that. <laughs> I kid around a lot, but I could, I could tell you in all honesty, when I started out pastoring, um, there is no way I would allow someone to tell me I'm wrong. I mean, because that's the way I was taught. I was taught that way. You're a pastor, you're not wrong. It's kind of like the Pope. <laughs> all I needed was the uh, thing, you know? The mitre. Uh, no, 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 no. That, 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 that's wrong. I, I crave the day when someone will come, and people have, and they say, Pastor Mike, I challenge you about what you said, or scripture, or something. Yes, I take that to heart. I take that to the word. I take that to prayer. I take that to God. Why? Because I don't want to mislead you. I don't want to be misled. And since I represent God, I better be make sure I'm right. Because even when I'm right, sometimes I could be wrong. Because we're all going to find out we're wrong. Some way, somehow. So God, church, and then it comes down to this. Let us consider that we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. 
not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we take this to heart, we have to consider one another. Love thinks the best. How many of you have been tempted, even recently, to want to talk negative about someone even in church? Come on, come on, you know it. Don't raise your hand, please, I'm not looking. <laughs> but we've been tempted, we're tempted. Why, because we're human. It's going to happen. But that's where the battle is, right there, at that moment. <laughs> Somebody wants to think the worst of me, great. I'm not going to give it back. I'm not. I choose to think the best. I choose to speak the best. Why? Because I don't have a choice. I think I do, but I really don't. If I say I'm his, that means I'm his. That means that person's first. They come first, not me. I got to put them first. I got to put them first. I got to do the right thing. That's the essence of a family, a church, the gathering place. The essence is that we are sharpening each other. Sharpening each other. Strengthening and encouraging every step of the way. Because it ultimately leads to the place of faith. Act in faith. If you have God and you have a strong body of believers and people and people that you trust and people that are around you, people that will encourage you and strengthen you, then when it comes time to act in faith, faith requires action. James 2.14 says, What is good, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and without food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. See, the difference between doing good and doing right comes down to this essential truth. Doing good is feeding someone, helping clothing, helping housing. That's doing good. If we don't add Christ in the mix, that's all it is. We're just doing good. And by the way, quick testimony. Uh, some of the ladies here know there was a, a woman who was pregnant and she was somehow involved with the state and a shelter and she needed a place to live or else her child would be taken by DCF. You know, then it's like almost impossible to get your child back. But anyhow, these women working together somehow helped that girl and found her a place. Am I right? Those of you that know, thank you, bless you. That's, um, that's a powerful testament to faith in action. Faith in action. It took time. It took time out of their schedule, time out of their life. It took making phone calls or visiting or seeing people or, you know, and, and putting themselves on the line. That's what it takes. Faith requires action. A requirement. Now, maybe your action, maybe you're saying, well, I'm too old. I can't do this. I can't do that. You can give. Well, I don't have money. You can give your prayers. You can give your time. You can give your encouragement. We all have that something to give. See, when it comes to acting in faith, how do you get more faith? Do you ever think about that? How do you get more faith? Anybody know? How do you get more faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? Ah. Faith is really all about thinking about God. It's all about him. This goes back to number one, God. It's thinking about God, his person, his character, his attributes, uh, his promises towards us. And the greater and the longer that you spend time dwelling on the goodness of God, just like the song we sang, the greater your faith will begin to increase. Why? Because you spend more time with him. You trust him more. 
You know, when you have a friend, a friend becomes a good friend only by spending more time with them, right? That's what we have to do with God. The greater your faith becomes in him is all about how much time he takes up in our life. If we only spend, you know, out of all the hours in a week, if we only spend one hour or two hours on Sunday and another hour during the week thinking or praying or reading about God, it's probably not going to affect your life all that much. Of course, some of you will be saying, yeah, but I don't want to become a holy roller. I used to laugh at that expression. I used to laugh at those people. I'm one of them. But it's, see, but it's cool. Because there's a piece that you can't steal from me. Nobody. You can't steal it. can't take it. No matter what comes my way. The more your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions resolve to move forward in the direction of God, the more your faith will grow. Romans 12, 2 says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed <laughs> by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you, listen, listen, you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will. <laughs> we change only one place, right on the edge. You remember me speaking about it. When we get to the edge, we're a desperate, nowhere else to go. We're at the precipice. That's when we change. God knows that too about us. He knows that about you. He knows that about me. We need our mind changed. Resolving to do something comes down to our choosing to put God first. God is the only one, by his grace, his power, that he could bring forth faith in and through our lives. So a lot of Christians reach this point. They got God down. They, they, they're spending time in him, praying with him, and reading his word. And, and, and they, they know what it's like to get to that place where they could say, oh God, but please, please, I want more of you. I'm hungry for you. They got that down. They know what it's like to be in that place. They belong to a church. Maybe not ours, but, you know, still a good church. There's a couple out there. And they press in, and they get involved. And, and they're involved in community outreaches and prayer groups and things that the church is involved in. And they begin to say, I'm feeling God pulling me in a certain direction. They understand what faith is. They begin to grow in faith. They begin to grow in strength in the Lord. They begin to recognize that they need to be changed in their mind, transformed in their mind. And God's at work, moving in and through your life. But it comes to a place. All of us reach this place. And the place is where God is trying to get you to go from here to here. He's trying to move you, maybe in the spirit, sometimes physically, but he's trying to move you in the direction of your thoughts, in the direction of your mind. He's trying to move you because he has a specific and unique plan for your life. Ephesians says this, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared for us in advance to do. God's trying to move us from the things we're doing and the things we feel comfortable in doing to the place where we're doing what he has called us to do as a, purpose, as a person. But the, the problem is the mind. This is the battle. The battle is all here. It's all here. And besides, the older we are, the more comfortable we are in life. Or at least the more comfortable we are with doing the same thing over and over again. Right? We're, we're, we're so comfortable that 
We don't want to think about moving outside the comfort zone in order to fulfill something God's called us to do. So I'm going to end with this little story. A long time ago, there was a very, very wealthy and powerful king, and he was given two baby eagles. And the eagles were extremely rare, very magnificent, and very, very expensive. Unlike anything he's ever seen before, these eagles pleased him. So the king decided to hire a caretaker to look after the eagles. Time went by, and the eagles grew to be these beautiful, impressive creatures, even more majestic than they were when he first received them. One day, the king asked the caretaker to signal the eagles to fly because he wanted to witness them in flight. So the caretaker did as instructed, and both eagles responded. However, one eagle soared way up into the heavens, and the other barely took a flight around and quickly returned to the same branch it had been perched on before. Puzzled by this, the king asked the caretaker, why is it that one flew so brilliantly and majestically off into the sky and the other just quickly returned to his perch? The caretaker said, I don't know. This is the way it's been since he was a baby eaglet. He wouldn't leave the branch for very long. The king was very fond of both eagles, and he longed to see the second one fly and soar as majestic as the first one. So he determined to solve the problem. He issued a proclamation throughout the kingdom. Anyone who could make the second eagle fly would be rewarded with great riches. So many scholars and experts tried to make the eagle soar using their vast knowledge and techniques, but none were successful. Months had passed by, and the king began to lose hope. The second eagle would only fly for short moments before returning quickly to its branch. Then one day, something miraculous happened. The king looked up and saw both eagles flying, soaring up into the heavens. Both. And they were there, just seemed hovering and riding the waves beautifully. Somebody succeeded where everybody else had failed. And the king was eager to meet this person. So the king ordered that he be brought before him the next day. Humble farmer stood before the king the following morning. After offering the promised reward, the king asked, how did you manage what so many great minds could not? And the farmer replied, your highness, I am but a simple man with no, simple, with no special knowledge. All I did was cut down the branch that the eagle was sitting on and with no branch to return to, it had no choice but to fly, and it did. The king realized the profound lesson behind the farmer's simple action. The eagles represent us. Each of us holds immense potential, just like those two majestic birds. But sometimes, like the second eagle, we're stuck in our own comfort zone, stuck on our branch. And the farmer's actions symbolize the power of change and the courage to step out of our comfort zones. The farmer didn't have any special wisdom or knowledge or tools. All he did was remove what was holding the eagle back. The branch was a comfort zone, familiar to the eagle. What the eagle didn't realize is that branch was holding him back from soaring to great heights. The lesson is clear to me that if we want to achieve new heights and fulfill our God-given purpose, we either must be willing to cut away the branch that holds us back, <laughs> which I know very few people are willing to do, or recognize that when the branches are eliminated from our life, it's usually for a purpose greater than ourselves. Who is it that cuts the branch? God may bring a person into your life. God may bring an enemy, a friend, a frenemy. God may bring someone into your life least expected that will cut the branch in your life. Sometimes the branch represents a relationship, a job, an investment, something. Most of the time, these branches hold habits and fears and doubts. And it's not until they're eliminated 
that we can experience the true potential. When that happens, when the branch is gone and there is nowhere to rest in comfort once again, we are at that place of change. When we move towards God in that time, when we move towards his purpose in our life, number four happens, and that is Jesus is glorified. Jesus is glorified in and through our life. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12 says, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's all about him. All of it. So your life is meant to bring glory to God. And that's really what our life is all about. So we have to do our part in order to reach that place where we're truly accomplishing the plans and the purpose and living within the vision that God set up for our life. Ultimately, it's all him. Because like I said, we won't cut our own branch. Normally, God works situations out so that the branch dies or somebody comes and cuts it off. Somebody comes into our life that just causes all kinds of chaos and we're cursing the devil and everything else. But all the while, it's really God working behind the scenes to get us off the perch so that we can soar and begin to do something we never thought possible. All of you can have the same sense of fulfillment, the same sense of gratitude, the same sense of completeness. Because I think the older we get, the more we already know what the branch is in our life. We already know. We know what holds us back. We know what holds us down. We know why we're afraid to move into things unknown. Oh, you mean you've got a missions trip? I don't know. I don't think I can go. I can't afford it. I can't take time off from work. I can't, I can't, I can't. No, it's really I won't. That's only one example. There's hundreds. You can do it. This message, I hope, will bring you hope. That there's time for change because God will redeem the day, the time, the hour. Doesn't matter how much time you have left. Some of us have less. What matters is what are you doing with it? So from here on out, you're responsible for your time and your talent and your treasure. Because now I told you about it. The Lord revealed it to you. So what are you going to do with it? Take it to God. Find a good church. Get to that place where you're willing to say yes to God by acting in faith. Because your life is meant to bring glory. Meant, I don't ever want to hear, and I know I'm going to, I don't ever want to hear, Pastor, I don't know what I should do. I don't know what to do. Take it to him. He'll tell you. He'll show you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. And in the end, <laughs> you're going to feel a sense of completeness and fullness and peace that nobody can steal or take away. Not only do you know you're saved, but you know you're in the right place at the right time doing exactly what God called you to do. That's worth its weight in gold. Trust me. So if that's you, I'm just going to close and we're going to open the altars for prayer, have some music praying quietly. If you want a fellowship, please go through the door. Try not to talk here. Move into the hall. Um, we're here to pray with you, whatever your need is. Maybe you want to know what that branch is or how to get rid of it. Now may the grace, uh, grace of God, 
the peace of our awesome Savior, Jesus Christ, and the power of his Spirit work together in and through our lives today and every day until we see each other again. God bless you.